What up, folks? You made it. It's your favorite comic on the come up. Back for season three of the Comedy Chatter Podcast. If you've been searching for a pod that talks all things comedy from the perspective of a rising comic, as well as kicking with some of the dopest comedians in the business, then this is the podcast for you. Yes, yes, yes. What's good, good people? How y'all feeling? I don't even got to ask, as a matter of fact. I know y'all good. I know y'all good. I'm good. Man, I'm so happy to finally be back with y'all. Season 3, Episode 4 of the Comedy Chatter Podcast. The only audio podcast from the perspective of an up-and-coming comedian. Up-and-coming, that means me. Hey, I'm Melvin Williams, man. I'm so glad y'all here with me this go-round. Because I got a very special treat for y'all. I've already kind of put it out there, you know. I kind of had this secret for a while. You know how you got that, you know, money in your pocket and be burning a hole in your pocket, you want to spin it? Or you got that secret that you want to tell? Hey, I was like, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and just kind of get this interview and I'm going to sit on it for a while. And then I'm going to go ahead and just kind of, you know, debut it and kind of post it out there, give everybody a date and see if they'll come check me out. So, hey, man, I got the one and only Mr. D.L. Hughley. Yes, indeed. One of the kings of comedy. Hey, man, I'm a lifelong fan. Uh, it was uh, mad shouts out to my man Ali Sadiq for hooking this thing up for me. I hit him up, you know, saw the DL was coming to Atlanta. I got a chance to interview him at the Atlanta Comedy Theater in uh, Atlanta, or Norcross to be exact. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, Ali hit him up, I guess, and, you know, hooked everything up. And, man, they treated me like family came in. Man, I got a super dope interview for him. I'm sure you guys are going to like it. So, hey, man, yeah, definitely. Hey, I, I told y'all. I told y'all I was going to drop it. I told y'all it was going to be on and pop it, man. So, yeah, I, I got that interview for you guys. But, hey, I got a few things. To, we got a few things to chat about first. Y'all already know. Y'all already know. Uh, y'all know how I always do it. I sh- my shouts out, Roger Feeney, Ann Arbor Comedy Showcase, the man that saw my vision and allowed me to start recording. Thank you so much. Which brings me to my other guy, Mr. David Pittman. David Pittman is the guy that uh, helped me with my sound and editing. You know, showed me how to put this whole thing together. If it wasn't for him, he saw my vision as well. You know, a couple after a couple of meetings, he showed me how to put this whole podcast thing together. And without those two cats, none of this would be possible. Here I am on season three, episode four. This is like my 26th episode. So, hey, man, I, I, I owe it all to them. Thank you all so much. I, obviously, I owe it to the comedians that I've uh, had a chance to interview uh, over, over the uh, past few years. We'll get into that a little bit later. But, uh, yeah, hey. Let's let's go ahead and just start with the with, with the good news. Let's go ahead and get the the real good news out the way. Motherfucker, I'm so proud of Georgia. I'm so proud of Wisconsin. I'm so proud of Pennsylvania. I'm so proud of my home state Michigan. Well, my home state is Illinois. I'm from Chicago originally, but I grew up in Michigan and both I'm proud of How about I'm proud of both of them motherfuckers? Because everybody, Arizona, Nevada, I'm proud of everybody that got it correct this time. And when I say got it correct, that's what the fuck I mean. I mean got it correct. Because if anybody has any type of soul, if you have any type of heart, if you have any type of heart and soul and you care about what's going on in our motherfucking country, then, hey, we had to get Donald Trump the fuck on out of there. You understand me? We had to make that happen. So... New president-elect Joe Biden, hey, congratulations to you, sir. Congratulations to his vice president-elect, Miss Kamala Harris. I'm I'm hoping that you guys are gonna get in there and do big things. But the first, hey, like, like I keep telling everybody, I'm not. I wasn't even on that business yet. I'll wait till January 20th before I get on that kick. But the first, hey, the first the half of the battle is already done, and that's getting that some bitch Donald Trump out of the White House, and hey, ain't, ain't he being such a coward right now, too, ain't he being such a bitch, like, I said it, yeah, I don't give a damn, like, hey, hey, let him hear it, I don't care, like, he being such a coward right now, like, talking about some, oh, I'm gonna try to change the election, and I don't wanna, I don't wanna concede, bitch, you lost, fair and square, like that some bitch told him on, uh, on, uh, The Last Dragon, on, on Lee, you know, Bruce Leroy, he told that mother, he said, if, I, if you'd have got me a title shot, he said, you lost, Rock. Every fight, I got you. Shit, hey, hey, he can't do nothing about that. You lost. Donald Trump, what the fuck, man? I don't, 
We don't, hey, we don't want you to be sitting around talking about some of this. He's still on that kick. I heard the other day he come out with his first interview. Keep in mind, this motherfucker been sulking for like three weeks. The motherfucker been sulking for like a month because he lost. He only doing bullshit tweets. But finally, he don't do his first interview. First of all, you gonna come out there with that goddamn turkey on Thanksgiving. Bitch, you the turkey. How about that? Use the turkey. Asking about pardons. This some bitch asking. This one you know you crooked. When you ask, can you pardon yourself? That's what he, <laughs> that was one of his questions to the people. Hey man, can I pardon myself just in case some bullshit happened? Ain't that a trip? And people still running around, 73 million people still voting for this some bitch. Like really? Like, I'm sorry, I'm fired up about this shit. Hey dog, I sat there that night when they was voting and all that. I was like, you know, I ain't about to watch this shit because I, I wouldn't be able to, like, if Donald Trump had a messed around and won that night, like I would have I tore some shit up, man. I would have tore my crib up, so. So, I, hey, I'm happy the way things happened. You know, we took a little while. They had to count them votes because they had a whole lot of mail-ins. And he trying to like he act like he don't understand all that, all the mail-in votes and COVID and all of that shit. He just, oh, man, this election is rigged. No, nah, bitch, it ain't rigged. You lost. And anybody else that's that's a man, if you're a man or a woman, if, you, if, you're, if you're an adult, you'll step up and be like, hey, I lost. I can see Hillary conceded to him. She like, she I lost. Hey, let's just go ahead and make this, you know, hey, let's go ahead and do the transition. You know what I'm saying? And make this country better. That's that's that was that was let's get this man a chance. That's what she said. But we gave that son bitch a chance, and for four years he ain't done nothing but fuck up the whole fuck up everything. And I don't care what nobody say. I know we're gonna get some people, oh yeah, you down Trump. Hey, he lost. It's time for some new blood. And we got President elect Joe Biden in there and Kamala Harris in there. And hey, we're going to see what the hell happened with them. Now, that, 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 that's all to it. Anybody still pissed off about the whole Donald Trump thing? Hey, we was pissed off about him when he won. So you just got to be pissed off. Shit, flat the hell out. All right, for those of y'all that's hip, my back in the day sponsor. My back in the day sponsor this go around. Man, I feel, I damn near feel bad for these motherfuckers. But my back in the day sponsor this go around is MySpace. Holy shit. What dude, what happened to MySpace? Like, dog. First of all, bet not none of you one of you motherfuckers still have a MySpace. Like you still if you still logging on to your MySpace right now, like man, you're gonna have to have a talk. Like that's like seriously. Like you 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 holding on to some major issues in your motherfucking life if you still got your MySpace. Like I don't even know if you can if you can pull up my I don't know. But dude, I'm just I'm just thinking about it. Like like MySpace was my first like that was my first dabble into this all this social media shit. Like somebody was like, "Man, you got to get on MySpace." And they said that shit came out in like 2003. So that's a year before Facebook was even thought about. You know what I mean? So that motherfucker came out and everybody they said it was like like 200 like million people on that bitch. Like everybody had a had a MySpace. But I just show you how fickle motherfuckers can be. Like hey, Facebook comes out a year later in like 2006 like don't nobody fuck with MySpace no more. Like ain't that, ain't that a bitch? Like it, dude <laughs> like they, I heard recently. That's what made me think about it. I heard recently they said that they, um, you know, just you know, all of all of the shit that they had, like all the stuff people had downloaded and everything, all the music and all the all the information and stuff like that. And they recently just lost all of that shit. It's like, man, it's, it's a wrap. They just, they basically just saying, hey, fuck all of y'all, all the shit y'all had on here. We ain't keeping this site no more because nobody fuck with us no more. So we just deleted all y'all shit. That's basically what they saying. But man. <laughs> My back in the day sponsor this go around is MySpace. Two thousand three, them some bitches came out, and Facebook just took all this shit. I mean, you got you know you got all the other ones now too, but Facebook was pretty much the one that took. I'm just think, keeping it real, like for me, that's what took me from MySpace. Like I, I got jumped on Facebook, and I was just like, shit, I don't know about even fuck with this MySpace shit no more. It's hard to stay relevant in 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 in, in the world, man. I'm telling you. It's hard to stay relevant. We got to, I'm telling you, it's hard to stay relevant. And that's the whole, that's the problem in a whole lot of motherfucking industries. Like, all type of shit. Business, uh, you know, definitely comedy. Like, definitely comedy. You see all these comedians out here that's trying their best to stay relevant and shit. It's tough. It's, it's, it's a tough go around. 
All right, so what am I going to chat about this go around? What am I going to chat about? I know it will be perf- perf- perfect to chat about my, um, you know, sort of my uh, evolution as to how I got here in terms of my podcast. My podcast, like I said, it's been a journey, three, three year, three year journey as of right now. So in, in interviewing D.L. Hughley, man, is huge for me because, you know, like I said, he's somebody that, you know, I, I'm a fan of. But to get to this, it's almost like I got to a point to where I can, you know, actually make interviews like him happen. I remember when I first started this thing, I was just like, you know what, I'm just going to kind of, you know, interview whatever comedian that I could, you know, get whatever comedians that'll, you know, will give me the opportunity. And, you know, I'll just catch them, you know, at the Ann Arbor Comedy Showcase, you know, where, where I, you know, it's my home club. I'll just catch them when they're there and ask them and try to get an interview and, you know. And that, that's kind of how I started. They, like, like I told y'all, you know, uh, Rogers, the uh, manager at the Ann Arbor Comedy Showcase, I told him, I said, I want to start a podcast and maybe the uh, comedians to come in here, I can interview them in the green room. He was like, yeah, of course, that, that'd be great. You're just going to ask them if, they, if they, they agree, that's cool. So my first podcast interview, first podcast episode was June of 2017. June 2017, and it was with my man Dean Edwards, Saturday Night Live alum, you know, Denzel Washington impersonator, man, he, he's great, he, he's an awesome guy, he does his own podcast right now called The Father Muckin' Protocol, y'all might want to mess with that, he does it on IG, uh, or whatever, you know, podcasts are found, you can kind of get some uh, ep- uh, other episodes as well, but he's been doing the Zoom stuff, you know, because of COVID as of late. But yeah, he was my first interview, man, and it's it's crazy to look back on that because um, he you know came by the Ann Comedy Showcase, tore the place down. But I asked him, he said yes. We shot it right in the green room, man, or you know what I'm saying. I, he was able, he gave me he gave me a lot of love, and you guys can go back and check that interview out. As a matter of fact, like I said, the first interview, the first episode on the Comedy Chatter Pod. What was another uh, memorable one? Uh, Roy Wood Jr. I'm a huge fan of his. At that time, I was definitely a huge fan because he had just done his uh, comedy special. He had just done his comedy special, Father Figure. And I was like, oh, shit, man, this special dope as hell. And then I reached out to him one day. And it was it was crazy. You know how sometimes you just, like, you know, almost like you just you know, just reach out to somebody on, on email. You never think they're going to email back. You know right, right? Like, so I saw his email on, a, you know, on his website. He just had an email on the website. I emailed this guy and I, you know, just kind of tell him, hey, man, you know, this, that, and the other. I'm sitting here in the airport. I think I was in the airport at the time. I had my laptop and I just emailed him. And I could not believe this, this fool emailed me back emailed me back and we just kind of sat there and kicked it for a while I guess he was trying to kill time waiting on a damn plane like I was waiting on I don't know but he emailed me back and then after that I started just kind of lightweight stalking him just kind of every now and then what up Roy Wood hope all is well bro you know just kind of act like I'm his friend and shit now <laughs> but, but but it culminated with uh, him uh, coming to Minnesota for a show one time. And I just so happened to be on a layover in Minnesota. And so I was like, hey, man, I know this might sound crazy, but I'm in, you know, in Minnesota as well. I'm wondering if, uh, you know, I could get an interview for my podcast. Man, this fool said, yeah. Not only did he say, yeah, he told me to meet him over at the hotel that he was staying and, you know, brought me up to his room, dog, and, and set me, I had my little setup with my microphone and everything, and gave me like a 50-minute interview. And, dude, uh, to this day, I'm, 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 I'm elated. Like, thank you so much, Roy Wood, for doing that, man, because it's clearly one of the, you know, uh, most listened to um, episodes on my pod because of, you know, Roy's success. But, yeah, that, that was that was a definitely another memorable one. Um what was another uh memorable Rodney Perry Rodney Perry hey you guys know Rodney Perry from you know his a uh, dope comedy but uh he's also uh you know done some uh, film and some TV he was in Medea's Big Happy Family man you, you, you funny cat too real funny cat his stand up is amazing I had to uh, sneak up on him after I would uh, Facebook stalked him for a while. I was just kind of Facebook and Instagram like, hey, man, I was wondering if I could get an interview. See, now I'm kind of feeling myself because I done got, you know, Dean Edwards. I done got Roy Wood. So now I'm kind of stepping out of just the Ann Arbor Comedy Showcase and I'm emailing folks and asking them, hey, man, can I, you know, can I, can I get an interview? 
So Rodney Perry wasn't wasn't responding to shit. He was like, yeah, I, you know, it was just crooked. See, why he was never responding, never saying nothing. So I was like, damn. But then I messed around and saw that he was performing in Detroit, in Southfield, at the Punchline in Southfield. I was like, oh hell, y'all just so happened to be at, at you know at, at home or just say at the crib. I call it the crib, uh, you know, Michigan because like I said that's where I grew up. So I just so happened to be at the crib. I was like, oh man, he hit. I, I'm, 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 I'm running up on him. So that's basically what I did. I ran up on him, man. I got there. I told him, I said, I got an interview with um. <laughs> I just basically told the people at the front door I'm supposed to be interviewing Rodney Perry tonight. They let me in. I talked to the owner. She's like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, I ain't know nothing about it. Blah blah blah. <laughs> Shit, he didn't know nothing about it, you know. But guess what? I saw him, you know, ran into him. We went in the back in the green room. Gave me a super dope interview. You guys need to check that one out as well. Rodney Perry. We were at the Southfield uh, Punchline in uh, you know, Southfield, Michigan, man. Real dope. That's that's pretty much been. The the gist of my of my of my journey, man, in terms of uh, podcasting, it's just me uh, reaching out to you know comedians, comedians that I that I fuck with too. By the way, like I I ain't just you know just whoever show up I want to interview. I'm not, I'm not I'm not saying anything against them. I'm just saying people that I'm a fan of, you know, comics that I you know I, I, I admire their journey. I appreciate you know stuff they say on stage. I may have something in common with them. Those are the comedians that I interview. So it's a it's a million comedians that, you know, out there to interview. But um, you know, those are the ones that I, you know, that, that I that I mess with, the ones that I'm trying to interview. I got I, I got a I got a wish list. I got a wish list as of right now because like I said, you know, hey, I feel if I can get DL Hughley shit. A lot of these other motherfuckers should be able to come and say, hey, let's 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 do this, man. I, I only want about 15, 20 minutes. I don't want nothing major, you know what I'm saying? So um Ricky Smiley, Ricky Smiley is definitely on my list. I heard he a little, you know, I heard he a little um uh, cantankerous though. Like he don't I heard he don't really fuck around with people he don't know like that. So <laughs> so I'm gonna try to work on Ricky, getting Ricky Smiley uh to definitely uh do do the podcast. Uh, Barry Brewer is another uh, talented cat out of uh, Chicago. He's out in L.A. now, but uh, he's doing his thing, man. He has already had a comedy special that he uh, did in his hometown of Chicago. I think that's on Amazon Prime. Um, he has uh, the show Bruz that's on the BET network, you know, with Tyler Perry. Like this, this is a young, this is a young gun, but he hey, he doing his thing. So I definitely want to interview him. Said. Said the entertainer, you know, like you know, hopefully, hopefully he'll see that DL did my did my shit and be like, oh man, DL did it all. Oh, I gotta do it. Ho- <laughs> hopefully, hopefully he'll do that. But yeah, man, I got a nice little wish list of comedians that I still want to interview, and I'm gonna keep on doing what I'm doing. But as for right now, I gotta let y'all in on this uh, interview with DL Hughley. I know that's what y'all waiting on. So without further ado, Comedy Chatter Podcast Season Three, Episode Four. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for tuning in. Comedy Chatter Podcast. I got the one and only, one of the kings. Just like my man Steve Harvey said, the kings of comedy. Mr. D.L. Hughley. How you doing, sir? I'm wonderful. Man. Everything is good. Everything's wonderful. Hey man, I enjoyed the show tonight. Thank you, man. I especially loved it. I, I saw both shows, man. and the crowd was real turned up for yeah. that second one, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, they had all the energy. Yeah, you know, at, at the first show they usually get off work. Yeah. And they come because they got to. They want. <laughs> the second one, nigga, I did this on purpose. Exactly. You know, yeah. So they definitely enjoyed it, for man. Sure. Definitely. So that was great. Uh, I usually uh, started off kind of like with a little sports. Question just kind of ask. So, who do you mess with when it comes with sports? I know you like a Los Angeles kind of oh, dude, right? Thorough, thorough. Yeah, all right. I'm a USC dude. USC. I'm a Laker dude. I'm Laker. A okay. So, yes, yeah, so you had a good year with them Lakers this year. Well, then. Yeah, other than COVID. <laughs> <laughs> COVID yeah. and Kobe, it was a great year. Yeah, yes, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's true. That's true. So, speaking of that, so you are, uh, South, I think, South Central, right? Yeah. Is that where you grew up? Yeah. Okay. The where so, all niggas grew up. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 <laughs> Definitely. So, that was uh, the only place we could live okay okay the only place we can live in, in, Cal- in los angeles was uh, south central you can live in compton you can live in inglewood you can live in carson or you could live in cerritos if you was doing good but it was bad. i never really realized how segregated it was until i was 19 years old when the first time i ever went to the beach 
and it was seven miles away from where I grew up. Oh, wow. Because there was no need to go. Like, everything I ever knew was in that area. So it's funny how um, people talk about how limited we are, but once they put uh, walls in our minds, we maintain them. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You say you're only seven miles away. It never only even... seven miles away. Yeah. Straight, straight down West Street. Man, yeah, I was gonna ask about that too. So South Central, growing up there, uh, everybody saw like the movie Boys in the Hood, and sure. me, me being a Midwest dude, I thought that was like a million miles away. Was it really like that? Was it really like? I, I, you know, it's so funny when you when you travel a lot, you realize um, it's very unfortunate. But we all have lived the same lives. The cities are different, but the streets and the mentalities and the hardships and the struggles are really the same. Yeah, and yeah. and. What, the saddest thing I ever, uh, one of the saddest things I realized was how committed I was as a kid to my neighborhood. But I realized when you get older that your neighborhood is wherever we are. That's true. Good we, point. We're the only people in this Good country point. that you, could, you can't find a white person in this country who was born in Oklahoma can relate to a dude in New York. Yeah. Or a person in Boston can relate. Black people are connected as much by our struggles as we are by our victories. And it's very unique and specific to just us. Even even a Mexican from from Arizona is different from one from from Texas, mm-hmm. different from one from Georgia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it, but we have a commonality that is so universal. It, it is a connective tissue that that's true. almost no one can deny. Yeah, that's true. Like I said, I was, I, we had our little stuff, but I I always like wanted to ask somebody like from Los Angeles, yeah, like was it really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. was it really like that? So, all right. So now, so this is about our comedy journeys. So I basically wanted to ask you, kind of like where you like did comedy find you, or you found comedy? Where did you start? What happened? You know, uh, years ago, I was reading about a famous artist, and he, and he was a great sculptor, and they asked him, um, how did he create his art? And he said the art, the, the sculptor was already there. I just let it out. Mm-hmm. And I think comedy's been that way for me. Okay. So it's um, it's always been a thing. Like I wasn't athletic and I wasn't smart and I wasn't. Uh, 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 so what I had was the ability to to speak clearly from my perspective, and I didn't know that that would be comedy. Mm-hmm. Um, but I did know that it would be. I knew that I would do something where I got to say what I saw. Gotcha. And so it was comedy. Just so so for me, it's like uh, you could you could have a house, and that house could have a, a water source. But some of that source you use to cook or clean or take a shower, it's the same source, different uses. And, and my perspective has always been that. So uh, it would it, it just kind of worked its way out to be to be comedy. Okay. Okay. Now. Uh... Like me, like when I started, man, I kind of teetered the fence. Like, oh, yeah, I'm comedy, and oh, yeah, this might be a hobby. Were you all in when you first started, yeah, or was you like, he was all in? When you Imagine a thing that shows you things you'd have never saw. Yeah. It, it's imagine, when Superman knew he could fly, <laughs> he knew he would. So imagine finding a superpower yeah. and knowing what it was right away. Got Some it. people who are athletes, uh, their physical prowess is their perspective, and a lot of them could be tremendous athletes, but as as their physical prowess, uh, uh, there's attrition, no matter what, physically. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. your mind and perspective can always be sharp. Yes, yes. And so it was. It, it, it's one of those things that ages like like wine or like watches. Yeah. Or the, it's one of those things that ages with the exposure to the elements, and I think comedy is like that for me. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. All right, I'm gonna fast forward a little bit. Sure. Comedy act theater. I, I know one of your uh, biggest, uh, one of your biggest uh, people that you uh, that you dug, and one of mine as well was Mr. Late Great Robin Harris. Sure. Uh, I can remember uh, when I got this uh, tape a uh, long time ago. Baby's kids, the baby right. kids. I wore that tape out. It was so right. funny, it's hilarious. But I can remember now that I know your voice. I didn't know you back then, right. but now that I know your voice, right. you introduced him as the new boss of comedy, right. Mr. Robin Harris. Right. So please uh, kind of talk about Robin a little well, bit. Robin Tell me how I, funny he was. Robin and I, Robin was very funny, and I always loved and respected him. But he never liked me. Really? And I never, I never cared that he didn't like me. Really? But we would have arguments, um, um, because <laughs> he felt as if 
uh, he had struggled, and he, and he had, he had struggled so hard. Mm -hmm. And here I was, this kid who would, who would, who because of the time I came along in, oh, okay. would, have, would have benefited. So it was always a weird thing. I see what thing. you're saying. But yeah. two months before Robin died, we mm -hmm. got very close. Wow. And I was, the club that he did that, uh, Bay Bay's Kid album at mm -hmm. was a club that was mine. It was uh, I yeah. hosted, it was called the Birdland West. Yeah. And the only reason I got to introduce him was because days before he decided I could do it. Wow. It wasn't like a plan. It was like he decided I could do it and I didn't even know I was going to be doing it. So, um, uh, Man, so it, glad I asked that question. So right after that he died. <laughs> so Man, yeah, died so glad I asked that question. Yes, yeah, that's, that's some interesting perspective right there. Alright, uh, Comic View. Gotta get the comic view, cause without a doubt, like you was the you was the the, the best host of comic view, like out of all of them. Right. Cause I dug the Ricky Smiley uh, uh, year two, but you were definitely the best host. All I want to know is, well, I, I don't want to know some other stuff, but do you still watch any of those? Cause boy, they had they had you cross colored out every. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't watch it. I don't watch. I don't watch anything I used to be. Oh, okay. So you don't watch any old stuff. No, but okay. it's like it's like. Uh, my wife likes to look at our, 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 uh, our, you know, I guess when somebody <laughs> laments what they were, they they reminisce and look back at things. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying I don't notice the things. Like, I love the Kings of Comedy. I'll have to see it again. Yeah. I love Comic View. I'll have to see it again. Yeah. Because it was a place in time. And I think one time, one, there's, a, there's a weird energy when you connect to where you were that inhibits the, your expansive nature and who you're gonna be, and it believe you, you, in some ways believe that that's all you're capable of. And I never thought that, but I was very proud of Comic View, and and how other people got the host Comic View is because one day in the middle of the show, I just went, I don't want to do this anymore. Wow. And, okay, and so that's it wasn't that I didn't want to do it anymore. It's that I started liking it, and yeah. I started depending on it. So I knew that if I got, if I started to depend on something. That I had, I had crippled myself. Yeah, kind of get complacent. So I, I see just, what you're saying. I just, I just in the middle of the show said I ain't doing it anymore. Well, so you only did it that you only I did, did it two it years, two seasons. Okay. And then I went. Nah, in the middle of the show I said I ain't gonna do this anymore. And I said it on air when they would have to, when I had no choice. Wow. Okay. So I remember hearing, um, my my daddy used to always say, "Don't burn your bridges." Mm -hmm. But great warriors. Um, Spartans were famous for this. When they landed in enemy territory, they would burn their ships. So their only way forward, the only way through was forward. Forward, okay. And I think that uh, even though bridges, um, you shouldn't burn your bridges. Sometimes the bridge you burn lights your way forward. Gotcha. And I've gotcha. always, I've always believed that you can't marry what you are were and hope to be something else. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Now, the uh, past uh, comics that I've interviewed that have done the Def Comedy Jam and sure. Comic View, I always kind of ask them to kind of uh, compare and contrast uh, both of those. What was your, you told me about some Comic right. View. How was your uh, Def Jam experience? Is that something that you look back on? I never, and kinda... um, I, I loved uh, being a part of history, but I was never, uh, Def Jam was a real different thing because it was the first time Traditionally, you had only had one black comic at a time. Yeah. There was the Richard, or there was the Eddie, or there was uh, the Dick Gregory, or there was the Bill Cosby. So it was one black comic at a time. And and uh, Def Jam was the first time that so many comics were introduced at one point. Yeah. So Very many true. comics. You wouldn't Very have um, this cavalcade of comics that you had had it not been from Def Jam. Mm -hmm. But I was never really connect Like, um, Russell and uh, Bill, uh, Russell... Uh, uh, loved he loved Bill he loved Bernie he loved Adele and uh, I never did one Def Jam Jam comedy uh, tour I was just about to ask that did never. you do the tour okay never. wow because it was never uh, it just never it just never felt like something I, I, I one I wasn't invited <laughs> the <laughs> yeah, other is I just never I never it seemed too seductive to me hmm. it just seemed too too seductive and it it just, it just, I think it kills a part of your individualism. Okay. And and it, I regretted it at the time, and I thought I was making a mistake, but 30 years, 20, 20 years later, I realized I wasn't. Yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying, too. Yeah, because they kind of put y'all out there as the deaf right. comedy jam. Right, so we were, were all this yeah. this thing instead of this this individual. I understand, I understand. Now you uh, touched on it briefly, but I definitely got to get back to it. Kings of Comedy. Right. Uh, 
without a doubt one of my favorite right. uh, comedy specials. I want to know how uh, it kind of came because I at that point, at the point that y'all started it, all of y'all were killing stages individually. Right. So I wonder what kind of made y'all say, "Hey, let's kind of do this Voltron thing and come together." Well, and, like how'd that happen? Originally, they had uh, it was it was uh, it was uh, Bernie and Steve and said Bernie and uh, Steve and said were on. Um, they were on the Steve Harvey show. Yeah, 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 yeah. And Bernie was killing. And he was on this thing, but I was on uh, the Hughleys on on ABC. Yes, yes. And the only got reason I got on the tour was because um, somebody was missing the date, and it was in Houston. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think I heard like Guy Tory was on. Guy Tory at one point. Missed, yeah, Guy yeah. Tory was on, and he uh, he missed the date, and I filled in for him. Mm. And I crushed. Yeah. And then they said they wanted me to go on the rest of the dates. Exactly. But they wanted to pay me less. And I said, I won't take less. I'm going to take what everybody else takes. Mm. Or I won't do it. Of and course. I understood that they were going to say no. Of course. Because they had already built this thing. They were mm. playing theaters. But then uh, we, we started doing this thing where we did arenas. Mm -hmm. And um, it was the first time I had ever been on stage. It's almost like... Um, I was we, we were playing uh, uh, the United Center where, where Jordan played. Probably, yeah. And, and I'm and people laughed so hard at one time, <laughs> my teeth hurt. Like, and I was like, I'm not gonna tell this next joke. My head will blow off. Yeah. It was the first time I ever had that sensation. And I will say this about that group of people: they're the only comedians on the face of the earth who, at that point, had played comedy. Uh, clubs, corporate events, casinos, and arenas. It hadn't happened before. Yeah, of course. And, and that could be overwhelming, but my mother said something I, that I remember when this was happening. She said, if you could swim in five feet of water, you could swim in a thousand feet of water. Yeah. It's the same thing. True. And I had to remember that. Okay, cool, cool, cool. And you mentioned the Hughleys as well, man. Not a lot of people get that. Uh, I know you've done movies, you've done TV, and not everybody get that, uh, get that, you know, uh, that coveted um, TV show. Right. So how did you feel when you got that uh, TV show bearing your name, and how 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 did that how was that experience? I, I didn't like it. Didn't like it. No. All right. Um, did you not like just the TV whole thing, the whole thing about TV? I didn't like being responsible for that many people and things. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. I didn't like it. It, it, it made me feel uh, beholden to people. Gotcha. And I love the people that I work with. Mm -hmm. Don't get me wrong, and I felt very blessed to have it. Of course. But. Um, um, a wolf is never in the circus because inherently they're solitary. Okay. Like you'll see a gotcha. lion, you'll see a tiger, but a wolf because of the solitary nature. It just, but but for the first time in my career, I was responsible for the carpenters and the, the caterers and the electricians and the writers and the producers and the network. And I just, I didn't like, um, it felt obligatory okay it okay. felt like I was I was I, I remember being exhausted all the time because I knew that I had to come through for all these people and it felt like it took me away from from a single-mindedness that I think you need yeah. to, to kind of develop who you are and it, it seemed very selfish but I, I remember being exhausted and, and I, I didn't I didn't like that 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 whole process. I, I didn't like having to get there early and be there early and yeah. have to sit in all these meetings. It felt it felt inhibited. And yeah. then you were one of the producers and all that. I was deep producer. Deep producer, yep. So see, yeah, yeah. But so uh, they would say I wasn't, but if I did. So. <laughs> and I remember what made me feel the worst was like, I remember we are having contract negotiations because Chris Rock was an executive producer and I didn't know at the time that he had been signed on. Mm. And he was making more money than me and I remember going, hey man, I'm, I'm busting my ass. I gotta get more money. And you know what they did? They said, it was when the Cadillac truck came out. And they went, what if we gave you a Cadillac truck? And they gave me a Cadillac truck. And my father, he said this thing, give a nigga a Cadillac. <laughs> and I still have that truck right now with 60,000 miles on it. So it always, so it it always feel, felt disingenuous to me. Gotcha. Gotcha. I understand. I understand. And last but not least, man, like I said, I'll let you get out of here. I always ask this question to all the comics that I interview. Who are you kind of fanning on right now, if anybody? Is there anybody out there that makes DL laugh? No, and This every, could be uh, up and coming, or this could be no, like some of the... A lot of, the, a lot of things make me laugh. What I am fanning on is the expansive nature of this art form. Gotcha. I, I've, I've seen people make me laugh in all kinds of ways. 
What I what I dislike is how subservient people are to their audiences. Hmm. Okay. You, you, you gotta be comedy. Comedy is like being a cafeteria lady. You get what I'm serving. Yes, yes. Like you remember when your mama was for dinner, nigga. What I'm way, serving. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. <laughs> yeah, that's and a good. And you way didn't to get put the it. if you don't if you so. I believe that there is a nature in um, this antithetical to comedy that you want to be, that you want to please the people. Obviously, you don't want to displease the people you work with. That's mm-hmm. that that's that's uh, yeah, that's opposite of what I believe but I, I believe that you have to give people what's in your inventory um, we are manufacturers we're not retail stores gotcha. manufacturers make product retail stores carry them yeah. and if you start to confuse yourself with a retail store and, and, and you start to want your product everywhere then you've lost the very thing you're supposed to be and gotcha. I think the one thing that black artists of all stripes have been able to do is to make the world see itself clearly from 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 our perspective, and if we start to do what everybody else does, how are we special? Gotcha. I see if exactly I do what, what everybody saying, else yeah. can do, yeah. How am I special? Well, I've I never looked exactly at somebody else and went, uh, "I wish I could do that." What I have done is wish I could do what I do better. But I think the only thing you owe an audience is the best you have that day. All right. And if you believe that you can, um, I, there's this thing where everybody like I always hated like these people that redo something. Mm. They go, if you like Godfather, you're gonna like Godfather one, two, oh, three. Oh man, that's all they doing too. And, and that's and that's really all they doing. And yeah. and it's like, don't afraid be afraid to be with the next evolution of your all keeping it real means. Is being willing to be where you are. Yes. And I think that the one thing I would I would say to artists these days is yes, you will shed audience, but you shed skin every day. True. The skin True you wear right now will be totally different tomorrow than whether you see it tonight. And the audiences are like that too. They're artists that I've loved and I I haven't liked some of their subsequent work. But if I've connected to them, I'm willing to give them a chance to see if there's something else in their lexicon I, I relate to. I owe an audience and you owe the audience the same thing you owe humanity, which is the best version of yourself that you're capable of at that very moment. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Well, hey, thank you so very you much for work. giving me this uh, interview. Like I said, I'm going to definitely get on the phone and I talk with Sadiq and let him know how thankful I am. Like I said, I'm a huge fan of yours. Thank you. And uh, I also just wanted to say this. Uh, your voice, I know you kind of, you know, kind of um, make fun of the whole GD, this, that, and the other. And I even heard you at this uh, in this interview say you're not smart. But believe me, you're one of the smartest, one of the brightest, one of the most intelligent well, stand-up that. comedians ever. And I love the way that you, like, kind of speak for the people that, 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 that are not heard. And so I want you to continue to do well, that. I, so. And I, and I want to make something clear. I don't, I don't, the specifications that, that society ask somebody to reach to, I don't check those bars. Gotcha. But I believe I'm smart enough to know what I'm good at. Exactly. And I'm smart enough to know my strength and my weaknesses. Yes. Most people are afraid of the things they're weak at. Yes. Yes. Most people are afraid that people will find them out. My my intellect isn't something I use so that I discount myself. It's an honest assessment of how I feel. Gotcha. But it doesn't mean that I feel that I'm less than. It feels that I set an accurate bar Mm -hmm. and I understand who I am. And I understand what I'm capable of, mm. and I understand what I do bad, mm. and I'm not afraid for them to meet. Mm. But I would I would say this to you: never, ever, ever be afraid to lose something, because the thing that you gain could be so much greater. All right. And, that, and that's that's one thing you you gotta understand. You live in a world right now where people want what they want. The 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 greatest line in the movie that I ever heard. Um, uh, uh, Matthew Perry told Sam 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 Hayek in this movie. He said, "You're everything I never knew that I always wanted." Gotcha. And you have to live your life that way. Gotcha. I hear you. All right, man. I appreciate you so right, much, yeah, man. man. All right. Definitely. All right. Yo, thanks so much for checking out the pod. And a very, very, very special thanks to my man, the one and only D.L. Hughley. 
I appreciate him so much for giving me the opportunity of a lifetime to interview him. You guys can keep up with DL on his talk show. You can also check his website for future show and date information. Stay tuned and next go around for another episode of the Comedy Chatter Podcast with another super dope comedian and of course me, Meldon Williams. Y'all be good to yourselves and be good to each other. Peace out.